About two million years ago, at the beginning of the Pleistocene Ice Age, a river was born from gigantic melting glaciers in what is now called North America. The years transformed the trickle of water into one of the most powerful natural forces on this continent. But the power of this Mississippi River was a constructive one, for this was a building river. A great gulf which once divided the continental United States from near Cairo, Illinois south was filled with rich earth from the water, creating a giant valley as fertile as and larger than the Nile Valley. Yearly flooding and deposits of an alluvial soil called silt continued this building process and kept the land fertile. To this day, the Mississippi Delta continues as one of the most productive farmlands in the world. The ridges left behind by accumulated washes from this great river became town sites such as Memphis, Tennessee, St. Louis, Missouri, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans, Louisiana. The city of New Orleans rests on alluvial or riverborne soil which is at least 700 feet thick. Much of the state of Louisiana was formed by the Mississippi River. But now, man's attempts to harness this mighty water has led Louisiana to another state. Men settled along the banks of the Mississippi River to utilize this highway of water for transportation or commerce, or to farm the rich Delta land. The annual floods were intolerable, so levees were built to keep the river in its place. Thus began the process of denying the rich silt to the Delta, particularly in Louisiana the most recent land built up from the Mississippi River's silt. In 1928, the worst flood on record occurred. The Mississippi swelled within its levied confines and broke through in several places. An area the size of South Carolina was flooded. Better than 300 were dead, 700,000 were homeless, and more than $300 million in property damage was incurred. Congress acted to provide flood control. In 21 years, 982 million cubic yards of earth were utilized to construct superior levees from Cairoi, Illinois, to south of New Orleans. The new levees, now an average of 21 feet high, would not break. Floodgates and river outlets were installed. Now the river was in its place, and the people were safe from river flooding. This channeling of the river and its silt stopped the distribution of sediments and the accumulation of land in the river's delta for the first time. This means that we prevent flooding, and that's good. We need to prevent flooding and we protect development. But those levees have a side effect, and that side effect is that we maintain all the water, nutrients, and sediment that the Mississippi River carries in a small channel, which is empties into the Gulf of Mexico off the edge of the continental shelf. So all that wonderful sediment, over 200 million tons a year, is falling off the edge of the continental shelf. That's Ohio topsoil. That's the stuff that built this entire land that we sit on. New Orleans is built on those deltaic sediments that were built up uh, over 5,000 years, but we've stopped that process. We no longer let the river change its channel. 
and we confine it to a single channel and no longer let it have spring floods where it can carry those sediments into the wetlands. The rate of land loss in the delta here in uh, Louisiana has reached a rate of about 55 square miles a year. That rate of loss is increasing uh, uh, at the rate of maybe uh, 10 additional square miles each year. So you, you have a, a geometrically increasing rate of land loss. It's, uh, it's a, a problem of uh, very, very important magnitude here in Louisiana. The fact that uh, land is lost is, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a part of the natural process. The rate that that land is lost is something that is uh, human, is man affected. What used to be a paradise got broken and it got injured in a lot of different ways. And since that time, we've been sort of doing a patch job on it. And unfortunately, the patch job has worked out that uh, as you patch one area, uh, it springs a leak someplace else. And we continually do this, uh, trying to solve this problem over here and then this problem over here results. Uh, we solve the flood problem with the Mississippi River. We created a coastal erosion problem. We try to solve the coastal erosion problem, then something else is going to happen. And it all just results from the fact that man has impaired the natural course of, of events. We've, we've impaired uh, nature's way of healing itself. And so we end up basically in this this negative relationship with nature where we're constantly trying to, to repair the, the past damages, and I don't think we're ever going to really catch up with it. And I don't think that, the, that the, the persons who dealt it out, if you will, or the persons who were in office, saw the gravity of the, or saw the amount that they were giving up in exchange, because it just wasn't eminent that that trade was, it wasn't eminent that the trade was going to occur anytime, or the payoff would occur anytime soon. But I believe they have traded uh, in, in any number of situations, and whether you're talking about land loss or whether you're talking about the general quality of life, whether you're talking about the environmental problems the state has. Uh, we made exploration, we made business, and we made industry easy in this state to transform the state from a largely agricultural area to a more populated and to a more uh, productive oil, gas, petrochemical, industrial area. And there were trade-offs. And the bill collector's at the door now. Uh, he's expecting to get paid. Can we stop it? <laughs> Probably not. Probably we don't know enough. And it, 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 our knowledge of the problem and the causes and the solutions are just not at that state of the art yet in order to be able to solve the entire problem. For instance, sea level rise. There's many projections, different projections, on how high sea level is going to go in the future, rise in the future. Some are slow rates, some are fast rates, depending upon, some are based on the greenhouse effect, which would predict substantial rises in sea level. And if sea level since all marshes are mainly or primarily near sea level, any substantial rise in sea level will inundate and, and drown the marshes. The uh, subsidence of the land, the uh, sea level rise, uh, hurricanes, uh, other natural causes which are uh, very, very complex uh, have resulted in land loss over thousands of years. The, the land loss problem that Louisiana is experiencing is not a new problem. It's, it's been a, a circumstance for the state uh, for hundreds of thousands of years. They're actually talking about moving whole communities now, so it's past the, the it's almost past the stage of uh, damage to the environment and, and ecological damage to, to wildlife resources, fish and wildlife. It's now threatening human resources and uh, uh, communities. The state of Rhode Island would be gone in 21 years, the District of Columbia in seven years. It's the highest land loss rate of anywhere in the U.S., probably in the world. And in terms of percentage, it's right now probably around 0.8 or 1% a year. And the scary thing about it is that the rates have been accelerating. We're now at 50 square miles a year and they were zero at the turn of the century. We don't know what they are and what they're going to be in 10 years or 20 years. So the rates are high and they have a very high impact. 
Louisiana's vanishing coastline is a complex problem of water and land formation. Deprivation of alluvial silt has stopped land growth in most of the southern portion of the state. Another flood protection project called the Atchafalaya River Basin has created a regional problem around Morgan City, Louisiana of an opposite nature. The Mississippi River was vented into the Atchafalaya River as a means of controlling rising spring waters against the levees of the heavily populated cities of Baton Rouge and New Orleans downriver. The new outlet is not dredged as often as the Mississippi River, allowing the silt to accumulate in river channels hampering navigation and industrial access. What was the lifeblood of the marsh is choking Morgan City. We consider the siltation as a pollution. It's, a, it's silt that's brought from all over the central part of the United States down here, and it's deposited in our wetlands, and that's what's obliterating our wetlands. None of us want to lose our wetlands. We'd like to preserve them. But the deposition of silt means that it's smothering our wetlands, it's smothering our marshes, it's going to have its effect on the people and the industries around here, and we'd like to keep things as they used to be, as normal as we could. We've got to move more water out of the present channel of the Mississippi River and use the new channel of the Mississippi River, which is the Atchafalaya River. The Mississippi would have switched in 1950 or so had we not put control structures up at Old River around Simsport to prevent it from switching over into that new channel. We allow 30 percent of the Mississippi's water to go down the Atchafalaya. We need to allow more. I'm suggesting that we put an additional 2 percent per year until we reach 50-50 and monitor closely and see what happens. We will build a bigger delta in Atchafalaya Bay. I don't think there'll be extensive flooding. We can deal with that on the communities that are down on the Atchafalaya, like Morgan City. And we'll build all this enormous expanse of wetlands, which are beneficial. That's where our fish come from. These wetlands are the basis of that food chain, the fish, shrimp, crab food chain, everything Louisiana is famous for. And someday, I guess there will be a delta here. I don't know how many generations from now that that's going to occur, but uh, someday when the delta's here, I guess everything will uh, fall into place. But What's going to be in how many years of difficulty now and us, but all the surrounding areas going to have before some things like this are accomplished without any help. The plight of Morgan City dramatized the problems of dredging and channelization. Without navigation of the Mississippi River, bayous and canals, the economy of South Louisiana would be devastated as evidenced in Morgan City. On the other hand, Continued dredging and channelization of the waterways seems to spell certain doom for the eroding coastal wetland. Louisiana marshes have been sliced apart by an intricate system of thousands of man-made canals, leaving fresh alluvial soil exposed to the canal waters. Each canal has its own spoil bank levee, the byproduct of canal dredging. Scientists feel accelerated land loss parallels the numbers of canals dredged by changing the hydrology or natural water flow of the marsh. At the center of the debate lies the question, is the present quality of human life in Louisiana worth the loss of our land, or can a compromise be made? Probably the most important and the most easily accomplished thing that we can do right now is to stop doing all this dredging. We're issuing dredge and fill permits right and left all over the state. Uh, we're issue, we're, you know, right in the middle of, of this time when we're realizing that we're losing the marsh and we're losing the coastal areas, hundreds of these dredging permits are being issued and people are continuing to build canals and they're continuing to, to destroy valuable areas of the marsh. And that's in order to uh, accommodate oil and gas production and, and business activities in the marsh. We've got to make a decision. We can't continue to, to trade off the marsh for the economic development uh, because there's no way to get the marsh back. Channelization is for navigational purposes such as the intercoastal waterway here, uh, the uh, Barataria waterway that goes uh, down through uh, Barataria estuary to Grand Isle. Uh, the Mississippi River Gulf outlet over in the St. Bernard Parish side is a good example of uh, navigational uh, waterways that, uh, that tremendously increase the rate of tidal exchange. Tidal exchange moves soil and uh, a waterway that is constructed as this one was as a relatively small 
navigational waterway uh, as a result of erosion becomes a large navigational waterway in a matter of a very few years. The ability of a channel like that to carry water under storm tide situations or dropping tide situations increases uh, geometrically in relationship to the increase in size and cross section. The Corps maintains a system of navigation projects and in those projects we're using those materials that come out of those channels like today we're building marsh down at Southwest Pass at the Baratar Bay Waterway which goes through the southern part of Jefferson Parish and several other projects to actually take that material and create marsh. The dredging of the Mississippi River Gulf Island, in my estimation, is the single largest contributor to saltwater intrusion, not only in St. Bernard Parish, but in, in, the, in, in the United States. Uh, it was an environmental disaster. It levied off areas that were once free to tidal flows, and it made other areas more susceptible to land loss and to saltwater intrusion. Singularly, it's probably the largest cause of saltwater intrusion and erosion in St. Bernard Parish. Places like Chenero Tig lost 40 to 60 feet of land because they started dredging the shell ridges out of Southwest Pass to the east of them. When that happens, when that water starts rolling and it doesn't stop, it gets a good roll. When it hits land, it's like a boxer hitting a punching bag. And it just disintegrates whatever's there. And it puts all that stuff in your marshes. Well, that's what's going to start happening to towns like Abbeville because it's starting to disintegrate the land that's the marsh, the shell ridges are gone, the oyster reefs and such, and then that water just starts working its way up because the ridges of the other area are sinking. We need our streams. We need our streams for navigation. We need our streams for drainage. And we need channels for that. And you know this, this uh, idea that channels is bad, it's artificial and everything, it's the most ridiculous thing going. If you're going to take a beautiful mountain stream and channelize it, it might be bad. But here we have a floodway that's filling up, and all we're asking for is a reinstatement of the channels we had. Yeah, in terms of the amount of dredging that goes on and uh, maintenance dredging for the uh, the waterways isn't really all that much. I think that uh, uh, what happens in the in the way of new dredging, which is the most damaging, is uh, oil exploration. We've dug a series of canals and then more canals and then more canals so that if you get in a helicopter now and you look down into that marsh, what you'll see is um, a, it looks like a giant patchwork quilt. Everything's in squares. There's canals upon canals upon canals. That stopped the natural ebb and flow of the marsh. As the economic problems continue and the economic problems uh, are felt not only by the state, but felt by the industries of the state. We must remember uh, on, on all fairness that uh, oil and gas does produce virtually one third of the state's revenues. And they're probably as uh, adversely impacted in this tough economic time as anyone else in the state, and maybe a little bit more. But it makes it real difficult to convince uh, those industries, all the people of the state, that uh, the that those companies must pay more in order to protect the resources that are expected to be here forever. Uh, I think we ought to do it. You know, I think you're mortgaging the future if you don't do it. But uh, it's hard to, to get that point across in a difficult economic situation. The, the state worked hand in hand with the oil companies to allow just unrestricted canal dredging. And they have known about uh, the damage these canals do for 20 or 30 years. Everyone was riding high on the gravy train, and so no one was about to tell the oil companies, none of the state elected officials, and, and we weren't. You know, the general citizenry of the state was not going to say, don't drill that rig in, in, in the marshes I own. Uh, you know, if the oil company said, well, the only way we can drill there and make you a millionaire is if we dredge a canal, the average guy is going to say, so what's, what's another couple of hundred acres of marsh? Well, it all adds up. When you say canals, you're talking about a lot more than simply oil and gas related canals. Uh, but from the perspective of the oil and gas industry, uh, these canals uh, are, are a necessary part of our, our industry. It's, it's uh, channelization for the oil and gas industry is the primary means of access to oil and gas deposits in South Louisiana. Dredging activities are the major man-made activity on this coast, and most of the dredging activity involves putting a spoil bank of the dredge material, building it onto the side 
of the canal. The canal is used for sometimes navigation, but mostly oil and gas recovery. The spoil bank is much higher than the natural levee. The spoil bank may be uh, two to 10 feet high, usually around two feet or four feet, whereas the natural levee may be just a foot high. This spoil bank prevents water from moving over the top with sediments and water, and sediments don't get in. Even in marshes, like fresh marshes, where there's virtually no sediment getting into a natural marsh, the spoil bank has an effect. And that's through, in all areas of the coast, through trapping water. If it doesn't allow water in, the marsh dries out and some things all oxidize. If, when storms get over the top of the levee, it doesn't let the water out as fast for the same reason it doesn't let it in, because it's a barrier. This promotes water logging of the plants. And as water logging kills the vegetation, Plants trap sediments, so whatever gets in gets trapped better. If the plants aren't there, it doesn't trap them. Plants also accumulate organic material in the soil beneath them. So if it doesn't have this organic matter because of the death of the plants due to water logging, you have less vertical accretion of organic matter. You need this vertical accretion to, take, to compensate for the downward movement of uh, sediments and soil and organic matter taking place b below. This happens because of the weight of the material above it and uh, compaction of soils, and to balance also the rise of sea level. So you always need to have some growth of sediments of soils vertically. And this doesn't happen when a spoil bank is there. It doesn't happen as fast. The average oil and gas related access canal uh, today impacts about 50% less area than it did just three, four, five years ago. So the oil and gas industry uh, has in fact reduced whatever impacts are associated with, uh, with the dredging of oil and gas access canals. You can fly over the marsh, you can see some of these patterns. You can see where a canal has crossed, where the spoil bank has crossed a natural channel, and frequently on the upstream side of it is silted in or, or eroded enormously, whereas downstream it'll st side of the channel it'll be intact. And this tells us that the basic hydrology of our marsh has been al altered drastically, and you need that water movement to uh, maintain the optimum health of the marsh. That's how it's formed. So it's somewhat like a spider's web. You have lots of things on a spider web holding the web itself there. You have little strands going off here and there. And we've clipped off some major uh, uh, strands of that spider's web. You've, you've changed the natural hydrology, which is a fairly major component forming that, the structure in the marsh. And you've clipped a couple uh, uh, strands over here which have to do with sediment distribution and the, the web just starts forming a very different shape and it doesn't function as well. Also if you fly over the marsh you can see places where next to the canal on the spoil bank on the side or maybe where canals of spoil banks have come together on two or three or even four sides you'll see after 10 or 12 years of this, 15 years, that it's been impounded, it's turned into a big water body. If you looked at these holes in the marsh, these new water bodies in the marsh, Look at where they are, you find that the distribution is, is in proportion to the distribution of canals and spoil banks. One effect of wetland erosion is saltwater intrusion. Land loss allows saltwater to intrude in vegetated areas. The salt kills the vegetation, destroys the root systems holding the spongy ground in place, and makes the wetlands more vulnerable to erosion. From a purely a visual concept, uh, it's quite evident what's happened. You go down the, um, the Bayou Dupree, off the Bayou Dupree structure just off the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, and the levied in area that had been protected from the saltwater intrusion is bountiful with trees and, and wild game and any number of things that live there. As you pass the levied in area and get to the area that's more susceptible to saltwater intrusion, you find what was, what was a cypress swamp that is now dead. There's virtually no life there. Hurricane Danny, I believe it was, brought in 12 feet of water on Chenier Otig. That water went inland. It got inside the levees and started washing the levees away from the inside out, so we're losing those levees. Plus the land sinking. You know, we lost, uh, for Danny, we lost 40 to 60 feet of beach on Chenier Otig alone. One storm. With the levees that are breaking down, you're getting saltwater intrusion. With the land sinking, uh, that water is working its way up the coastline, and we're losing land at an alarming rate. Once those levees are gone, you lose a quarter mile of land within five years. 
We can't vegetate the Southern Native Marshes, although there have been attempts to place some kinds of vegetation, hybrid vegetation, that will tolerate some degree of salt water. But uh, there is no vegetation I'm aware of that will tolerate salt water, period. Some complications of wetland erosion are attributed to natural causes, such as strong gulf currents, land compaction, and the greenhouse effect. The theory of sea level rise due to increased warmth of our planet and the melting of the polar caps. Still, land loss problems in South Louisiana can, in part, be traced to the river, which is no longer building delta land. The natural causes are basically as a result of subsidence, salt water intrusion, and rise in sea level. There are also some causes and subsidence is broken down into uh, several components. Some may be man-made, some may be natural. The whopping of the geosyncline in the area is part of the problem and causing some of the science, uh, subsidence. Compaction of the materials that have set, sediments that have been distributed and actually built the marsh or over time are compacting. Some are due to drainage, man-made, man's problems, drainage in the area, which lowers the water table in the area. Uh, and that's, that's our position, is that uh, uh, these natural causes and, and uh, uh, the levying of the Mississippi River are the primary causes of land loss in, in Louisiana. Man-made problems further complicate the issue. The Mississippi River drains some 1,250,000 square miles of the United States upriver from Louisiana. Millions use the river as a disposal for sewage, pesticides, and toxic chemicals all along the route to the Gulf. Uh, thousands and thousands of wells have been drilled, gas and oil. And in the process of drilling these wells, uh, different fluids, drilling modes, chemicals that are used in the drilling process are simply discharged into the local marshes and salt water that comes out as the gas and oil is extracted is also discharged. The salt water that comes out of the earth is sometimes as much as maybe a hundred times saltier than seawater. So it, even if it's discharged in a, in a salt water marsh can cause tremendous impacts. So the pollution aspects of that has, has really been devastating. Another area that's been hard for us is in sewage pollution. Because as the coastal areas have built up and the communities have developed, uh, in most cases, the ability to treat the, the human waste, the sewage that comes from these uh, areas and communities, has not built up at the same time. So now we've ended up with sewage pollution being one of the most serious problems we have along the coastal areas. If you come into an area that's natural, when you leave, that area should be just as natural as when you left. I don't think you should leave behind pollution simply because oil prices ain't what they should be. I don't think you should leave behind people with cancer. Now, can you blame them specifically? No, it's not just that. You have industry, you have a lot of poison put in by the farmers, and you also have a, a lot of pollution coming from the upstream. But now is the time to do something about it. It's not like uh, going out and pouring poison, excuse me, in Lake Pontchartrain or, uh, uh, say, uh, Lake Erie and then going out with a big work crew and saying, okay, the poison is here, and we're gonna scrape the bottom and clean it all up, and then we'll have a clean lake. Uh, our lakes aren't being poisoned, they're being uh, disintegrated. Well, there are a lot of pollutants in the Mississippi River, but the river in some cases is a lot cleaner than a lot of the rivers in Europe. And it's true that uh, like fertilizers have increased since 1975, they're probably doubled the con concentration of nitrogen and phosphorus in the river has doubled in, in just 10 years. So, I um, mean, there's a lot to clean up, but I, uh, it's clear that uh, marshes are growing where new silt has been deposited in the mouth of the river. I think the plants can handle what we have. They can handle pollutants a lot better than they can, than they can handle water logging and change in hydrology. The largest stumbling block to the problem is money. Hard economic facts must document the dollar value of Louisiana's wetlands to governmental agencies for funding purposes. Right now we can justify building small areas of marsh in various portions of Louisiana. We think we, think we have enough benefits to justify those projects, but to build large-scale projects 
that will save thousands of acres of marsh and create, in addition, thousands of acres of marsh. We need to come up with a lot more economic benefits. And therefore, we're underdoing a marsh valuation study, which is an attempting to value the marsh for its production value in terms of fish and wildlife for the commercial fishermen, for the sport fishermen and hunter, the value of the marsh as a hurricane buffer for cities and, and communities that live in this area, the value of the marsh as a buffer against saltwater intrusion into freshwater supplies for cities like Huma. We're trying to then put a value on that, and that's what this marsh valuation study is all about. We learned to use dollars instead of bartering. Uh, we learned to go to work for the various people. The oil industry came in at a time when the floods were there on the, on the highlands and where we needed money, we needed dollars. In many cases, the animals had died and the farms had bad. So we learned that and we welcomed it with open arms. We learned how to use dollars. We learned to outthink people from the outside. We're very, very adaptive in doing that. Some of us ourselves are now having pollution pits. Some of us are millionaires because of the oil field. But I kind of wonder about that. I really do. The question I have to ask is, would we have changed if oil industry hadn't come in? No, we wouldn't have. Are we blessed with it? That's a good question. Why don't you ask the shrimper now who goes out to shrimp and there's no more shrimp out there because of pollution? Why don't you ask the man dying of cancer? Why don't you ask the man who tries to farm and can't, finds he can't farm anymore? Because of what's happened in his field, because of the pit that the oil people left. Okay, what about the dollars? Well, listen, man, the dollars are great, you know? Everybody's leaving now. So right now, the Cajuns are starting to ask, how'd all this come about? You have to say, well, where were you when it was happening? Well, that's great, I was getting the check steady. So now, do we have an excuse to complain about pollution? Do we have an excuse to complain about what happened to the good life? Why are we bankrupt now? The thing is, we should have been taking care of our own business. Uh, it's going to take continued state resources that th there is not a perpetual funding mechanism for the Coastal Environmental Trust Fund. There was one in 1978 when the state enacted the first use tax. 25% uh, of the proceeds of that tax were going to go to the Coastal Environmental Trust Fund. The tax, as you know, was declared unconstitutional by the United States courts and therefore there is no dedication or continued funding source for the trust fund. If we, all of us as a people realize, if we realize what's happened and we turn towards the government and put pressure on our politicians, we'll get those dollars that we need to clean up the environment so that we can live. At least if we can't have money, we need the, the place to go out and be able to fish and to be able to plant something and fresh water to drink. The best justification for saving the marshlands of South Louisiana must be in terms of human life. The most destructive forces threatening the Louisiana coast are the frequent hurricanes that attack the state from the Gulf. Hurricane wind and tidal surges are responsible for the instantaneous and rapid rate of wetland loss. The only protection the people of Louisiana have from the big winds are the man-made levees, the barrier islands, and the deteriorating expanse of hurricane buffer area, the wetlands. Probably the best shock absorber God ever gave a man in terms of protecting him from uh, hurricanes is uh, a vast expanse of wetlands between him and the open ocean. And as those wetlands disappear, you're, uh, the, Gulf, the, the Gulf of Mexico is going to move closer to West Wego and Marrero, and uh, when the Gulf of Mexico is at the uh, backside of uh, or the outside of your flood protection levees, uh, <laughs> you got yourself a problem. By having a large breadth of marsh south of a community, the waves that run up would be dissipated and you would not have to build such a high levee protection system. Uh, a good example is the west bank of Jefferson Parish. Right now there's a large expanse of marsh south of Jefferson Parish down towards Baratara Bay. We predict by the year 2040 a good portion of that marsh south of the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway will totally disappear, allowing Gulf waves to come directly up against those levee systems. This could cause most of the west bank of Jefferson Parish to be continually flooded if that levee system stays at its same height. Therefore, we'd have to either enlarge that levee system drastically or try to preserve that marsh.
Hurricane Audrey in 1957. It came in, it affected Galveston all the way to Vermilion Bay and, and further to the to the east. What happened is we lost 500 people on, Pecan, on uh, Cameron Parish at that particular time. The houses on Pecan Island were floating a mile back. Two-story houses got washed away. All right, what's gonna happen if we get another major storm like that? There are no more levees left. There's a straight shot of water from Vermilion Bay, to Intracoastal, uh, Vermilion Bay at Intracoastal City, south to the locks, and then west to Pecan Island. There will be no more Pecan Island. There will be no more marsh left in that area, nor the animals, nor any of that. When the people in the feet uh, had uh, coffins of their ancestors floating down their streets, and the people in Morero had water up to their, their chins in their houses, uh, then they realized how important, uh, what a big problem coastal erosion is. Louisiana is widely known for its seafood. This industry may be the most immediate economic loss caused by wetland erosion. The wetlands of South Louisiana serve as a fisheries nursery for better than 80% of the commercial seafood in the Gulf. Almost virtually all those fisheries are dependent upon the marshes, not the open water. They come in when they're young, they grow in the marshes where they have a lot of food available because of the organic material and the marsh stems and the edge of the marsh acts as a refuge for larger predators. So they grow past this critical stage in their life and into the adults which are then harvested maybe in the estuaries, maybe offshore. So we're talking about 28% of the U.S. fisheries landings. Louisiana marshes support the largest population of overwintering waterfowl in the U.S and Louisiana lands the largest fur harvest in the U.S. And not only from a, a commercial point of view, but also from a recreational point of view. Uh, the people who go out and fish in the areas and they use them these areas for their recreation are adversely impacted also. The, a problem with the harvesting of oysters is uh, that oysters need a brackish water in order to live in and to prosper. As salt water comes closer to the populated areas, more of the former oyster growing areas are now subject to predators, to snails. And these boar snails make oyster production in the more salty areas impossible. Compounding that problem is the so-called red line or the pollution line coming southward from the more populated urban areas. And that line makes it impossible to harvest oysters uh, above that line. So the area in which the oyster harvesting can be accomplished is getting smaller and smaller each year. It doesn't mean that there won't be oysters. You just won't be uh, able to eat them because they'll be contaminated with uh, fecal coliform and uh, other disease-bearing organisms. It may be good for now, but what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years is that the areas in which these populations can breed and populate is going to be declining, and that's going to cause a very serious long-term negative impact. The, the, the estuaries are critical, absolutely essential to the continued productivity of uh, the wetland environment, uh, the fishery, if you will, of, uh, of the estuaries, so that uh, as you lose uh, the estuaries, uh, you'll lose productivity in, in the wetland, or in the uh, wetland, or the water, the aquatic environment. Uh, I'll grant you that, uh, that uh, commercial shrimp catches and uh, commercial fishing catches uh, stay at a fairly high level, but what you've got are more people fishing with more sophisticated equipment all the time. So you, you wind up taking a bigger, bigger percentage of the, the total population of, uh, of uh, shrimp and redfish and speckled trout, and uh, sooner or later that uh, you'll find yourself at the point of collapse there. Uh, some concern about redfish now, thanks to uh, blackened redfish on the menus around the world. That, that's what drives me really crazy, is these guys get together and they squabble over how many fish they can catch, or how many fish gill netters are catching, and they'll, God, they'll go to Baton Rouge to get the laws passed to stop gill netting or purse sending. But when it comes to, uh, uh, to the basic issue, the issue above all of these things, they see it, they know it, they complain about it, they shake their heads and say, gosh, you know, uh, uh, Schofield Bay, uh, uh, Bay Jacques was just a, a little lake two years ago. Yankee Pond was, was two acres wide when we first built our camp here. Now it's, it's you know, a lake. 
they see it. They see it. They see the passes widening. They see the duck ponds become lagoons. Lagoons become lakes. They see islands and reefs disappear every year. And they go out after a storm, and they can tell you that the that, that duck blind that used to be on a point of land is now out in the marsh, surrounded by acres of water. Not in the marsh, out in the lake, surrounded by acres of water. Sure, they know it. They experience it every day, and it and it it's real to them. But um, I don't. It's it's almost like we're afraid to face the truth. Recently, a national symposium of wetlands managers met in New Orleans. Over 100 scientists, engineers, managers, and agency personnel met for a week to discuss the crucial condition of the nation's wetlands, and in particular, Louisiana's. The land loss problem in Louisiana is enormous. It's the largest environmental problem in this country. It is an environmental catastrophe, and it, if it were occurring on either the east or west coast, steps would have been taken years ago to solve the problem. It is. At this time, about 60 square miles a year, which is greater than 100 acres a day. We've already lost an area over a million acres, which is one and a third times the size of the state of Rhode Island. It's an enormous problem, and it's getting worse. It, less than 10 years ago, this was not a problem because it wasn't recognized as one. We didn't know exactly how big a problem it was, and we have a much better idea now. And we didn't know the solutions because we didn't appreciate that it was a problem. And in a very short amount of time, in terms of social institutions, this has become a very serious issue. It's one that's obviously not going away. People are appreciating there's more money being spent on uh, the, the solution. So uh, you could be discouraged or cynical about how much progress has happened, but it is happening. There is progress. And then actually compared to larger issues like cleaning up Chesapeake Bay, we've gone far farther in a short amount of time with less money than they have. It just seems too big for the average person. And when I write about it, I've been trying to condense it into something you'll understand, like we'll lose 100 acres, what does that mean? Well, you know, the Superdome will be gone tomorrow. If that were sitting on a, uh, if 100 acres is, that, that'll cover the area that the Superdome, the Superdome is on, it would just disappear. And you talk about 50 square miles a year, and people don't comprehend what that means. They have no, no uh, conception of what 50 acres is. It's like talking about the federal deficit, what is $3 trillion? I know, I know what $100 is. I'd like to have it. But, but $3 trillion is uh, beyond the imagination. Very few people seem to comprehend just how critical uh, a problem this is and what kind of catastrophe waits, not several hundred years down the road, but uh, most of these scientists say within 50 to 60 years, these tremendously catastrophic events will start occurring. And these people aren't alarmists. Uh, they're just out there every day and they, and they know what's going to happen. Louisiana's hopes must lie in research, education, marsh management, and in the river itself. The same alluvial soil that built the great Mississippi Delta Valley must be recovered from the swift current of the Mississippi and deposited in the problem areas. The material is in the water. 400 million tons of silt each year are hurled into the deeps of the Gulf waters, enough mud to cover 3,240 square miles one inch deep. The problem is how to recover, clean, and transport that building material while there are still wetlands left on which to deposit it. We can remove navigation, that is, take ships out of the Mississippi River above head of passes, which is below all development in the Mississippi River. But we take ships out of the, of the present river through a system of locks, through Breton Sound, and get them out into the Gulf where they want to go. And then we stop dredging at the mouth of the present Mississippi River, and we allow it to fill in. It will fill in from that bed load from those heavy sediments. Each spring, when, when the massive water volumes come down the Mississippi River, those sediments that are built up there would be pushed over into those wetlands on each side. We'd build up some of the Plaquemines wetlands, some of the St. Bernard wetlands, some of the Barataria wetlands in that way. Help to reproduce the system as it was thousands of years ago before man began putting levees and control structures on the Mississippi River. There are several other things we can do. There are rock revetment programs where actual revetments are being built uh, particularly and, and most notably in St. Bernard along the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet. Uh, they are only being built on the southern shore, however. 
knowledge uh, remains exposed. Uh, rock revetments are another way of doing it. We, uh, refurbishing the marsh or planting the marsh, revegetating the marsh, is another way of combating the coastal erosion problems. The most pronounced and most successful way of combating it is introducing fresh water from the Mississippi River into the areas that are becoming more salty, or the areas that have been more susceptible to saltwater intrusion. And this is accomplished by an actual siphon pump from the Mississippi River that deposits in large quantities fresh water into the bays and into the bayous that don't have the fresh water coming. Trying to recreate in a man-made fashion what the Mississippi did years before there were levees to put the fresh water and the silt and the, the food bearing, uh, the food for the fisheries back into those marshes. In several areas that we've built the marsh, the marsh is there today. Some of the areas, like on the, east, on, on the east side of the river, we are having a problem because before the marsh can be recolonized by the marsh vegetation plants, the wave activity becomes so great that it's picked up and carried away. In these areas, we're trying to find solutions to hold that material in place until the marsh vegetation can recolonize. And once that vegetation does take place, though, we've been able to hold it in those areas. And we're trying different protective measures like use of tires and breakwaters and whatnot, floating breakwaters, to try and keep the waves off these areas until the marsh does take, the marsh vegetation takes over. I don't think you're going you're gonna to make new marshes by just putting silt in there. Silt kills everything, and all it does is pile up. You'll end up with some type of silt hill out there, which is sterile, and it's, uh, it, it has nothing to do as far as from a new marsh, no matter what they say. I think freshwater diversion uh, is one of the three or four most important things to be done. Freshwater diversion on a, on a gr very large scale. Uh, but I, I, I'm afraid that freshwater diversion by itself is not going to be a total solution because uh, something needs to be done to uh, slow down the rate of tidal exchange with wind changes and storm-driven tides. That may be uh, uh, a combination of uh, uh, improving the uh, strength and heft mass of the barrier islands, a combination of that and some strategically placed water control structures. All of these projects are major. They take a lot of money and as everybody knows, the state doesn't have very much money right now. The federal government has not been particularly interested in helping us out, so everything is, is uh, moving along at a snail's pace right now. There's a lot of very good people in the state who are very concerned about it, doing very good research and good work. The coastal section and the Department of Natural Resources is doing excellent work, but they're just not funded enough. They don't have enough uh, resources to really do as much as needs to be done right now. And in my department, we have the same problem. Uh, one freshwater diversion project for enhancement of fish and wildlife resources in that area, which will also re substantially reduce the rate of marsh loss in that particular area, is the freshwater diversion at Canaveral, Louisiana, on the east bank of the Mississippi River, uh, just about at the parish line between Plaquemines and St. And Bernard Parishes. Uh, that project is currently in design and projected, if Congress provides us the funds, to be constru begin construction next year. And that particular project will, will over its life, save up over 16,000 acres of marshland from eroding, as well as provide fresh water and nutrients for the area to enhance fish and wildlife. All these mechanical devices uh, for uh, controlling water flow they're, they're, they're important and uh, they may be a, a, a satisfactory, although it's yet to be proven, a satisfactory remedial measure to, to mitigate or reduce the amount of damage that's done by oil exploration and development, but it's by no means a restoration of the damage that was done. All of these things have been on the board and have been discussed in, in addition to another aspect that I introduced several times in the legislature and has never been successful in passing, and that is where there is a project that has a detrimental effect, but the detrimental effect is, does not outweigh the economic benefit, then in that case the permit would be issued as it is issued today, but there would have to be an equally uh, beneficial environmental impact off of a mitigation project which must occur along with the, uh, the project for, for exploration. 
Uh, that has never cleared committee. Uh, one of the problems with it, and you can see the problems with it, each time you do something that has an adverse environmental impact with a beneficial economic impact, you have to do something that has a more beneficial ecological impact. It's quite costly. The oil and gas industry comes at mitigation uh, from the perspective that we're not the major cause of land loss. And our mitigation efforts are related to what we believe uh, we cause in, in uh, land loss in South Louisiana. And there's no question but that, that uh, canals do represent um, some portion of Louisiana's land loss. We don't deny that, but we say that, that uh, the canals represent uh, nowhere near uh, the land loss that has been suggested by, by some. Probably the most uh, important underlying problem is that there is no organization no central location where regional analysis of the problem is being done and uh, region-wide plans are being developed to address the problem. We, we wind up with, uh, with uh, individual parishes taking action. Uh, our, our little park is uh, trying to take some independent action to protect itself. Uh, you wind up with the state doing some things, the Corps of Engineers doing some things, and they're, they're, they're all uh, best I can see, uh, disorganized and, uh, and relatively insignificant in terms of the total scale of the problem. In most occasions, we're having a spiritual awakening now simply because we're at the point where all of a sudden we have no income. As a people, what's happening is we're starting to ask vital questions. When you're getting a check from Exxon or Chevron or somebody else, what happens is you didn't worry about that, but now is who's going to feed my kids? How am I going to get the money to do that? How come I can't plant? How come I can't how come somebody's telling me on television that my water's polluted? Where'd all this come from? It, it really is everybody's responsibility. It would be, it would be foolish. It would be, it would be foolish and, and and futile if we tried to point the finger at one group or agency or industry and say they're at fault because we're all at fault. In the sewage area, that's everybody's sewage. It's not just uh, a plant here or there. In the pollution, uh, we're all deriving benefits. We're all using those products. So. We have to get the public to understand that it's everybody's responsibility. Even though some people need to be regulated more, more strictly, we're still all playing a part in what's happening here. And the sooner that people accept that responsibility and begin to be concerned about it, I think the sooner we're going to see the whole problem being transformed and some real solutions being found. Is it too late? We've got to start now and take a chance. It probably is too late. But I don't look forward to seeing all the members of my family dying in agony from cancer. And uh, I'd like to have grandchildren at one point. I'd like for them to go out in that marsh and be able to hunt alligators and crabs, uh, you know, fish for crabs, fish for shrimp, fish for fish, and not be afraid to eat it. With the economy the way it is nowadays, what may well be happening is that might be the only means of food we have. I'm afraid that people regard the problem as so huge that it's incapable of comprehension. And it being capable of comprehension that they have no role in, in playing how to correct it. And there is a role. And the role is that uh, legislators and lawmakers have to be more, be made aware that their constituents are concerned about the problems. And to make the difficult choices of applying uh, dollars or effort or laws or restrictions or whatever in, in dealing with it. That's the only frustration that I have. The data I have indicates that uh, we can still do it, that there's enough sediment in the Mississippi River to save most of those wetlands, that even if sea level rise occurs, and it is occurring, um, there's enough sediment there. I'll remember, I'm only talking about a quarter of an inch a year spread over this whole coastal zone. So we have to spread a couple of inches, well, so we have to spread one whole inch. There's still enough sediment in the river to do that to stay ahead of sea level rise. There's enough, um, enough fresh water, enough sediment, enough nutrients in the river to do that. It did it for 5,000 years. That's why we're here. That's why this land is here. All we have to do is go back to something simulating that old natural system. I think we need a statewide program with a lot of local initiatives to do it and, and not uh, a few programs in a few places uh, centralized. I think this is going to have to be a decentralized effort to do it. We need the cooperation for everybody to do it. That means it has to be a non-aggressive approach. And it needs a lot of education. And you need the cooperation of the people who own the land and the people who benefit from the well-being of that land. 
And uh, whether it can or it cannot be done really doesn't matter because it's something we have to do, so. Unless there's a dramatic turnaround, uh, just suddenly people say, you know, yes, we believe that there's a problem and, and we will uh, get something done. I don't think anything's going to happen until we suffer um, uh, a real catastrophe. Uh, so, you know, a coastal city wipe, wiped away. So, you know, uh, in, in one storm, and it can happen, one storm, um, several hundred square miles erased, uh, coastal and marsh erased. Kind of like the Mississippi River flood of 1927 created the levees on both sides. Exactly. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I think it's going to take something like that to move people to say, okay, we've got to do something. And, uh, you know, I hope it happens. You know, if, that's, if that's what it takes, I hope it happens in the next couple of years. You know, while we still have something left to go out and say, okay, this is where we draw the line, and we're going to get to work right now. Having grown up in Louisiana, I spent a great deal of time, particularly in the southern part of the state, out on the waterways and in the marsh areas. And it's just beautiful. I know there's a lot of city people that have never really gotten out there and seen it, and I would encourage anybody to do it, because if you get out there in the marsh and you see how special it is, you begin to understand how important it is that we preserve it, not just for ourselves, but for our children and for future generations. There's nothing like it anywhere in the world. And we've basically traded that off out of ignorance because we didn't know how precious it was. And if we can begin to see what it really means to us and what it will mean for hundreds of years and, and centuries into the future, uh, I think that it will become obvious that something has to be done. So there's a lot to be said for just getting out into the marshes, even if you just drive or buy a friend's boat and just get out there and see it, uh, not only because it, it's educational, but also, also because it may be your last chance to see it.